Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker to advance the frontier of architectural thinking. And today I am bringing you back another episode uh, with my good friend and colleague and longtime collaborator Mark Jasenbeck. And what I'm talking about with him today is not one of the projects that we have worked on together, but one of his pet projects, which is thinking about the implications of the data society on contemporary, uh, contemporary architecture and contemporary architectural thinking. He recently published a book called The Digital Stockholm Syndrome, in which he uncovers our abject, I guess, fascination for the digital social. Here we go. Listen to this conversation on Mark's amazing and always serendipitous and questioning opinions on this topic. Here we go. Architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Welcome to Architecture Talk, Mark. Yet another one of our conversations. This time we are talking about your small but powerful book. I mean small physically. A book called Digital Stockholm Syndrome in the post-ontological age. So it seems to me, just going through it, that you are inaugurating some kind of a new onto-epistemology, sort of a digital onto-epistemology for something called the data human or the data socius or the data being or the data way of being in the world or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. So before we get into the Stockholm syndrome and our sort of infatuation with it, if you like, what is the post-ontological age? Why why would you claim we are post-ontological when uh, people are talking about object-oriented or ontologies? Well, thank you again for you know, having another conversation with you, Vikram, I always enjoy these. The always just seem to be getting better every time. So I think the, you know, I mean, talking about post-ontology is a little bit, some sort of presumptuous in a way, but I just don't find any other really word for it. <clears throat> you know, no one disputes the fact that we live in the digital age. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's like already, <laughs> it's like, well, duh, you know, uh, we live in a digital age, and we have to assume that it has infected, uh, infected, or e- and affected who we are as humans. Often, the conversation is about our social connections. It's about certain things that AI can do for us. Um, you know, we treat the digital age in a very narrow bandwidth, often of uh, conversation, but we really mm-hmm. have a hard time talking about it, how it goes into us, how it has shaped us, how it is shaping us as individuals long before we become other 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 things. And part of that reason is it's it's hard to feel the digital age. You know, I can mm. have a smartwatch, I can have a computer, I can have certain technologies <clears throat> that sort of are indicating that I live in a digital age, but I don't feel how the algorithms that are governing my various activities and as sliced through me in various ways are performing. And okay. that's also a powerful aspect of living in the digital age is how we are being molded and modulated uh, by uh, these sort of algorithmic realities that we don't see that, that are blended into the natural environment. And so that's the part that I'm sort of interested in, you know, having a conversation about, right? These sort of the invisible okay. participation of us in these worlds. But 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 let's, before we get into that, so this sort of uh, infection of the human by the digital that you're talking about, are you talking about this as in 
as the Marxist, as Adorno talked about ideology, as something that's become invisible but pervasive, but nevertheless with the idea that there is still a sense of a residual human beyond that, which presumably in Marxism will be the uh, agent of transformation? Mm -hmm. Or do you mean this more encompassingly that the onto human or the psychoanalytic human has become obsolete, gone, erased, overcome? Uh, certainly the latter. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there is no residual core anymore. In the book, I talk about the human and the inhuman, where the word in is in parentheses. Mm. And, you know, in the old school, we made a distinction in our language between the human and the inhuman, for whatever reasons, and however we might want to value that, but that was a, just a very clear and simple linguistical trope. Mm -hmm. But now we're not sure where the inhuman is. And so the inhuman is now in parentheses and it sits before the word human. And so it might be inhuman. It might be also more than human, you know, in a way, right? So in other words, we have become it, more it being here digital. It, it, it here being the data. Yeah, that's right. So in other words, these sort of algorithmic ontologies that we define, we are defined by, but also that we are helping to define. It pushes us to a type of the limits of what we can understand within our corporal, moral, physical, bacteriological, and even global identities. I mean, we just cannot ever experience the breadth of that ontological space in which we live anymore. So, you know, in the old modernist school, ontology, I mean, that's why I begin the quotation with Kant, you know, he says, you know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of one thing, you know, mm -hmm. and basically mm -hmm. it sounds all very reasonable to us as moderns, but basically he was arguing against, you know, the old Plato theological idea that the mind is one thing and the body is another thing. And these things are intention and our ontology was sort of split. Mm -hmm. And really the idea that we're one thing is a, is a, an enlightenment project that was mm -hmm. affirmed by the modernist project with psychology and you and I, and we're all basically everyone else. We're all sort of the, the sons and daughters of this premise that we are sort of one, one sort of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we're not, mm -hmm. we're called schizophrenic or we're called bipolar or we have ADD disease or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So we live in a world. But even if we have ADD or schizophrenia or whatever, by the modernist conception, that is still us as distinguished from the not us or what you're calling the non-human, the, the rest of the world. That's right. There, there's some sort of normative. <clears throat> yeah. The post-ontology doesn't care about normative. In fact, it likes the non-normative because data often works by finding things that are unusual, the, the things that the, the, the pixels that don't fit right against the norm so it sort of likes the fact that the more data there is you can certainly find patterns but you also can find unpatterned things that mm -hmm. still need to be patterned right so it doesn't really care that much about making things normative right it actually likes sort of unnormativity and um so in other words i can take my watch and then if i have uh, uh fibrillations right? It'll give me an alert, right? <laughs> you, you know, mm -hmm. your heart's not doing, you know, doing some problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or if I'm supposed to walk 10,000 steps and I don't, 9,000, right? It'll give me an alert, right? That I'm not following these things. So it's it both establishes certain types of norms, but it also establishes the non-normative. And this type of interrelationship is sort of new for us, right? And it's very hard for us to sort of feel how these algorithms are operating in that way. Why is it new for us? Wouldn't you say that the normative, the term that you're using in the Foucauldian enlightenment sense and the Bentham panopticon sense 
is already something we have deeply internalized. And that's maybe where the Stockholm syndrome idea it grounds itself because basically it's an hallucinogenic relationship where we sort of feel like we're in charge of our humanness or our body or our mm -hmm. souls even, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we are not, you know, and the thing is, this isn't hard to prove. It's just that it's impossible to experience. And you know, what I'm that, saying is, how is that difference from different from normativity or heteronormativity, say, or uh, the exercise of self in a pre-digital way? How how has this sort of ideological penetration of our sense of self become different with with the digital age? Well, it it it, it becomes different in that the in any different possible ways. It would sort of, yeah. one, one thing it becomes, you could say it becomes sharper. You know, mm -hmm. the digital age wants us to become ever more, let's say, pixelated within the, the backdrop of humanity. So mm -hmm. we're not just differentiated by gender, by sexual orientation, we're differentiated by the fact that I like red hats and you, you like, you know, baseball caps. And we're continuously being identified through a bunch of things that before we would never have been identified at that way because there's just no way to ever figure out how many people like baseball caps as opposed, as opposed to knitted hats. Mm -hmm. But now, if I buy a baseball cap, the assumption is I'm a baseball cap person mm -hmm. and you know I will get the... Uh, prompts for more mm -hmm. baseball caps and probably, you know, prompts from baseball franchises, you know, to buy t-shirts and things. So they are, our ontology is sort of out there being continuously being looked at and studied and the return coefficient, like a magnetic space around all of us is operating sometimes, I mean, almost all the times blindly right? Because these algorithms are not human, right? They're, they're operating in a, in a like machines, mm. but they, they feel very real to often, you know, and that's, you know, a different thing than the old school sort of ad agency or marketing agency, which tried to get me to buy Cheerios because I'm of a particular type of social strata, particular type of co consumer, so therefore, they'll predict that most of those people will want to have Cheerios rather than, I don't know, some other types of things, wheat, Wheaties. Um, but now, um, all of that is much closer to me, as we all know. And yeah. that's the problem that I'm trying to say. This builds a whole new relationship to the ontological project that is the foundation of the modern project. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of the difference. You know, did you ever see the series Mad Men? Uh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. So the yeah. madman is kind of the old world, right? I mean, where they're That's trying right. to seduce you mm -hmm. into buying something through various mm -hmm. suggestive associations. But here they are not trying to seduce you into buying things. It's become, from what I'm hearing you say, a kind of a tentacular... It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you are buying, yeah. as long yeah. as you buy, right? In other words... Yeah, in a way, right? I mean, yes, I, I would, you know, whether I do Verizon or whether I do AT and T makes a big difference to Verizon and AT and T, you know, in terms of market share and all that. Mm -hmm. So they'll still want to sort of try to seduce me in one way or the other in, in the conventional way. Mm -hmm. But data capitalism, which is everywhere. I mean, all capitalism today is data capitalism. There just is no such other, there's no alternative to that really, unless you go to some distant country, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you buy a tomato, you know, on the side of the street or something, but all capitalism today is data capitalism. And therefore it's, uh, it's managed through a wide range of expectations and data horizons about which we know absolutely nothing, but which determine everything. Mm -hmm. And yet, mm -hmm. you know, we the once again, it, it's not like 
we say, oh my God, that's so shocking. We actually love it. Um, and we're completely buy into it. And that's the Stockholm syndrome, right? We don't, we have completely naturalized it. And in fact, we give out the data without ever really thinking about it as such anymore. So is it supra data capitalism or has it gone beyond capitalism, consumer capitalism? Well, definitely gone beyond capitalism, you know, because it's infested or and infected and inflected the very principles of the nation state, mm -hmm. uh, very principles of politics, social behavior, and all of these things. So it's not just capitalism. I think the United States version of this is heavily invested in capitalism. Um, there are other versions in the world? Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, the nation state version, yeah. you know, which is operates every, everywhere now, which Chinese have made a whole, uh, built their entire future around the principle uh, of social engineering through uh, data management, mm -hmm. you know, as, as superior to data capitalism. Mm -hmm. So data capitalism is in some sense a product of national onto management. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's not here in the United States. Here, it's sort of maybe I don't, I don't know if it's you know, where we're heading. <laughs> what What is it in Europe? You think? Well, in Europe, because of their much heightened anxiety about privacy, in some sense, sort of built in some breaks on the sort of invasive nature of it. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist in 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 powerful regimes of operating. The privacy, so basically, a subset of the American system. You would argue. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah, but China has a very different project, where it's the sort of social engineered power. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Um, what about tried, India? Uh, India is a huge, huge data, data place. Yeah. Well, they India, you know, they they sort of like the Chinese model, and they're trying to uh, replicate it. <clears throat> they're not uh -huh. going to work. It's not going to work for the Chinese either. I mean, if I may be so bold, um, <laughs> largely because of how algorithms work. <clears throat> algorithms are always being invented on top of other algorithms. And so you're always basically, you know, one small step ahead of a certain type of crashes or failures that are embedded in the system. And in the book, I'd say that the very things that we talk about, you know, uh, malware, ransomware, hackware, all of these things are just part of the natural system of data. They're, they're not the bad things. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you don't have data and data collection without all of those things, right? They're mm -hmm. as natural as good weather and bad weather. Mm -hmm. So the cost of continuously updating and upgrading your own system, you know, because five years from now, the computers will be faster, so they're going to have to upgrade. But upgrading the information for a couple of billion people is going to take a lot more time than it does if you have to upgrade for a corporation with a thousand people. And then it's going to be expensive. And then there are going to be crashes and, and things like that. So at some moment, it's going to start falling apart. Now, it's not going to happen next year, and it's not going to happen probably in two or three years. But you say five or six or seven years from now, the expense of all this is going to just overwhelm the capacity to keep up. Hmm. And then what? So then data will win again? If you think data is going to bring down the Chinese state? Yeah. You know, so I think it's um, the airports just got hacked just yesterday. This stuff is easy if you don't hmm. have the most sophisticated defense programming. Data defense... I don't know what proportion of defending your data is in actually compared to acquiring it. I think acquiring data is going to be, let's say, I don't know, something, let's say like 10%, 8, 90% of your expense is in mm. defending the data. Mm -hmm. And at some moment, you know, it becomes like impossible uh, to do that. So because the hack's going to get better, the ransomware is going to get better. They they are like uh, viruses. They just continuously will improve along with the other technologies. 
So you see the Ukraine war is just completely anachronistic. Oh, yeah, the Ukraine, the Ukraine war, you know, comes out of the old imperial mentality just to beat the shit out of your neighbor. And, you know, that puts him back, you know, 10 or 15 years. It's what yeah. the Romans did. It's what the Chinese did. It's what every empire does. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's tragic because one would have hoped in the 21st century that's not how people operate anymore, but apparently... Because we are not data humans. We don't need old style wars anymore it's just the data wars that matter well that's what one would have thought i mean you know with the american election a few years ago one would have thought the russians were on the uh, vanguard right of the yeah. type post ontological warfare yeah but that turns out, out be, they aren't but it turns out they're not that good at it they're not even that good at regular warfare <laughs> but post ontological warfare is already happening Every boardroom is basically a war room because the boardrooms have to basically figure out how to protect their data, their special algorithms, and so forth and so on. So this warfare is already happening in the silent corridors of capitalistic power. We just don't see it. Okay, We're I want to switch. I want to switch scales and sort of ricochet back to the individual. But before we do that. Why don't we have you read a small section from your book? Okay. I was thinking the introduction to chapter seven, the onto social. I'm open to anything else also in the context of the discussion, but that's what I tentatively pulled out. Okay. Before Buddha invented renunciation, before Christians invented martyrdom, before Muhammad invented jihad, before the Hebrews invented monotheism, before Plato invented the dreaded cave in which we supposedly live, blind to the presence of all that is good, people talk to each other in freer ways. They talked of dead ancestors. They talked to rocks, to trees, to animals, to spirits. A being global world returns us to ancient possibilities repressed under centuries and layers of civilizational ideologies and naturalized self-mutilations. I can talk with my grandmother, but I can also talk with my refrigerator, my washing machine, thermostat, and car ignition, all of which can send me messages and suggestions. At MIT, they're developing a special toilet. Soon, even my shit will have something to say. <laughs> it's unclear to me whether you think your shit having something to say is good or bad. I mean, in the old days, people looked at shit very carefully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You get to the, the question of, you know, how we identify ourselves as humans when we're having these conversations with machines, with our shit, with whatever hmm. that we've never had before. Well, we were cyborgs always. This is uh, Donna Haraway's point in... Uh, cyborg manifesto and even Bruno Latour sort of sort of picks up on this who you know just passed away well <clears throat> with the exception that I'm talking about communication rather than technological human technological interfabricationality right I'm talking about how we communicate mm -hmm. um, you know technology has facilitated that but we don't see the technology right we just see the shit is sending me an email and but of course, it has to go up to the satellites and got to go here and got to go there. It's got to go to the data warehouses and so forth like that. So the capacity to communicate is, for me, extremely interesting. And it's different from the social networking project of Facebook or Twitter, that which we obsess so much. Because all of a sudden, we can talk to inanimate things, supposedly mm -hmm. inanimate things, right, that are now mm -hmm. all of a sudden animate. Or crying out loud, you get into your car and the car every morning when you turn it on says, you know, hello, Vikram. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it is true. But 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 you don't like that, but you like us talking to trees and rocks. I mean, like what's the difference? Well, pretty soon, maybe that rock will speak to us. You know, how, who who are we to say? I mean, we used to speak to rocks yeah. and trees. So, so now this we talk isn't to, really... now, we talk, now the shit talks to us and my car talks to me. And exactly. My... So I'm saying it has, what it has done is actually enhanced certain types of 
awarenesses of who we are as humans. And that's once again, why it's post-ontological because in, in the conventional ontology, conversation is either one-to-one or one-to-two. It's, you know, it, there's a sort of some groups, right? But it's Hannah always Rents. Hannah humans, Rents, ideals, yeah, yeah. Uh, humans, you know. Yeah, yeah. Now we're having conversations um, that are stretched the possibility of what human, human conversations are. So this is a data conversation. We are being recorded digitally and it's going to go out on a podcast and enter the data, data universe. So is there any residual onto human conversation in the conversation that you and I are having right now? Uh, well, <clears> that's a good question. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we, we could parse that in different ways. Right. Okay. In the most cynical way, we could say no, because both you and I are already uh, reformed. We don't feel it, but we have been reformed in the last 10, 15 years or so by the sort of the data ontological atmospheres or so forth. And because we don't feel it, we don't notice it. We've completely naturalized it. Right. On the other hand, we could say that we are struggling to try to maintain, let's say, the human despite all of this, right? There's a sort of resistance mm. mechanism. Resistance, yeah. But this resistance is not going to work, you know, very well because what does it mean? I just turn on my turn off my iPhone or I don't use the computers for a few days. I mean, even if I go to Maine and have one light bulb, who's going to do that? So the resistance is, requires such an extreme form of behavior that it's just really not possible anymore, right? I mean, the data ontology has saturated itself into the very, very, very furthest reaches of reality. Okay, so answer one, no, there, there is no human here. No, 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 the human, the, 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 <laughs> the data ontology loves the human. The human is what gives it its life, gives it its surprises, gives it its uh, capitalistic capacity. The data ontology basically wants a human to be more human. You want you to go out and socialize and, and go to the clubs and drink, you know, <laughs> wine so that it can uh, give you better wine lists. And, and yeah. you know, it, it wants you to, to get out of your house and, and have a life because then it has more things to talk about. So give me an example of a, a resistance practice, praxis. Oh, <clears throat> well... <laughs> I do outline a few possibilities in in the book, uh -huh. but whether that I, I where whether I don't know. I'm trying to think of some of these sort of some of these myself. But one could imagine, and these things have, that now do exist, right? Where you create false narrative for false flag identities. No, where, like the fake museum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> so where you clutter up the data streams by false flag identities. It will just love it. It will just love it. The data will love it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and they, they, they will love it. There might be consequences for you, but if you have a thick skin and don't care, then it's perfectly fine. Unfortunately, only let's say one person does it or two people do it or some artists do it. But if thousands of people start producing false flag identities, uh, the whole thing becomes quickly absurd, right? Distinguish this from fake news. Well, it's not that it's not that far from it. I mean, let's see. Fake news is, in some sense, a way to, in some sense, produce the hallucinogenic effect of the excesses that the onto digital requires. So, if fake news becomes always fake, right? In other words, if it, everything becomes fake news, then after a while you just turn turn it off and you just it's, it's not you know going to work, right? right? So yeah. there has to be some magical moment where fake news is always like 10% or 5% or, you know, mm -hmm. some percentage, minority percentage of what might be called real news. So that you In can the always... the last election, it was 51%. Okay, so we see, yeah. But <laughs> but, <laughs> but if it's more than, more than 51, yeah. it's all fake news and everything is shifting signifier. Yeah. And then the Googles and the Facebooks, you know, or basically can't compete with that. And then it, it becomes a dog chasing its tail forever. 
So there, there's a sort of magical, probably proportion of fake news to quote unquote real news. And the encounter, so like on when I open up Google News on the bottom, there's these guys who are telling you that fake news is fake, right? So it says, President Trump said something, is this true or false? And it'll say, no, this is fake or this is true, right? So now we have a whole industry, which is to basically tell us the fake news is fake, right? So this is that sort of that border condition between, let's say, some idea of enlightenment truth telling and some idea of post ontological truth production, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and no, there, there is no truth telling as such in your view. In your view, as I understand it, there is this constant slippage and interconnectivity and entanglement between fake and real news as a necessary mechanism by which this whole system operates. Yes, yes, that's right. There's a very entanglement. And on one hand, it requires vigilance. On the other hand, it requires paranoia. And vigilance and paranoia are basically now almost to become the same thing. So paranoia for Freud was caused when you're when you saw your mother having sex or something wrong. You know, I mean, you know, it was because of something happened when you're three years old. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, many people believe that nonsense <clears throat> up until the 80s. And paranoia diagnosed as a serious illness mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so forth. But now if you're not paranoid, there's something wrong with you, right? So now it's it flipped completely over mm. that if you need to be paranoid, but at to how much degree, right? To <laughs> you know, is it 10% of your personality is paranoid or 5%, right? If you're 90% paranoid, obviously you're not going to succeed in life very well. But you're not going to succeed in life if you're not paranoid either. Post ontology sort of embraces that weird slipping and slidiness, right, of things, relationship like vigilance and paranoia. So, two things the data algorithm feels to me to have a a being, for lack of a better word, similar to that given to the text by Derrida, like this sort of semi-autonomous zone, which nevertheless has a constitutive grasp and control onto my lived reality. And indeed, there is no way for me to access or communicate or engage the whole world other than through the rules of the structures of signification. Does that yes. make sense? Oh, yes. Yeah. This, this project is very Derridian, that's for sure. Yeah. You, you, there's no outside. So the only way to get towards the boundary is to work through these structures of signification. And that's ultimately not going to even help, right? It's not going to give you a result except in the effort. Right? The effort is, in some sense, the result, right? Mm. So sticking with the project and continuously trying to undermine it, undermine it, but it's always ahead of you, right? There's no way, certainly when it comes to data ontology that you and I are ever going to, or anybody, mm-hmm. is, is ever going to get around it, you know, um, mm-hmm. in that sense. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, the only time Foucault articulated a way to sort of be outside power was when he was discussing Goya, I think, Mm -hmm. right? His paintings, his madness paintings. And he described the paintings as empty glances shot from nowhere looking at nothing Mm -hmm. as the only possible sight outside of, of power. Or in Lacan, it's reading the agony or ecstasy of Saint Therese. You know, he talks about jouissance as sort of excess, right? So madness mm-hmm. and excess. Right. I mean, those are sort of other references. Or one can talk mm-hmm. about Dali's paranoid critical method, since we are talking about paranoia. But where where are you locating the the possible? Where, where ep, onto epistemically are you locating the site of escape from the Stockholm syndrome 
in this world if it isn't in the well-centered enlightenment subjectivity? Well, that's once again why I call it post-ontology because it, it post-ontology offers the escape and it offers the resistance. Mm -hmm. In other words, if, if you try to resist, right, it, you know, there really is no place to go, first of all, right? Because it is this mm -hmm. totalizing project, right? Mm -hmm. So it's either within capitalism or within the nation state or some other of these large mega formations. Mm -hmm. As soon as you buy something, you're you're in it, right? As yeah. soon as you vote, uh, you're in it and so forth <laughs> like that. So resistance is futile, right? So there, there's no such resistance, right? It, it's a question of how we can sort of tactically produce a sense of awareness that doesn't force us to fall into, let's say, the macro politics of paranoia. So in other Tactically words, produce a sense of awareness? I'm not following you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, let's say someone in our relatively immediate family, mm -hmm. you know, I would say is one of those people who thinks that the government is out to get you, that the vaccines are all bad, all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they've fallen into this classic deep end of paranoia that is now available to you in the post-digital world. Right. If you want, if you want that, you go online. You know, they're always getting. We've always been it. We stopped it now. But we, you know, she'll say, "Oh, online. You know, if you go here to this website, it'll tell you all about how the vaccines, you know, are killing people in Africa and whatever." Right. So, and as we all know, the digital ontology is, is not moral. It doesn't care. It just wants people to circulate. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why in the book, I call this like a heat system. It's a thermodynamical project. It's not a project about technology, about humans and technology. The old cyborg is mm -hmm. really a very modernist project. This is a mm -hmm. thermodynamic project in which humans and data are circulating in the requirement that they produce heat, right? And heat means that things have to move. Mm -hmm. So whatever gets things to move. I mean, this could be physical movements like a car or my package or, you know, FedEx trucks uh, mm -hmm. could move. I mean, in fact, the first data management in capitalism was through automobiles and packaging. Mm -hmm. But it could be missiles. It could be atoms. Anything that moves <laughs> is a good target for data collection. So you want things to move. And you want ideas to move and you want emails to move and you want likes and thumbs up and things to go viral. All of these things produce a hallucinogenic effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is uh, entropy then? I mean, I'm just thinking from the perspective of physics since you have brought in thermodynamics. It takes energy to get thermodynamic systems happening. And that it runs against the grain of the natural uh, dictate of the universe, which wants higher and higher entropy or sort of mm -hmm. lesser and lesser energy, everything, right? Yeah. The human animal is a kind of a very low entropic, high energy complex system, mm -hmm. which which is why we die so quickly is because, you know, it can't be sustained for very long. Thermodynamics, amongst other things, breaks <clears throat> us down. That's right. Well, basically, data is once high entropy, right? It wants things to, in other words, if it's entropy is too low, it's just not interested, too boring, right? right? Yeah. So yeah. things have to be agitated in order for data to be effective. Because, um, as explained in the book, there's no such thing as data anyway. Data always re requires more data. Mm -hmm. So data is always a data-seeking enterprise. So data so, is yeah. equal to data plus more data. Yeah, exactly. Data is always I, equal to data plus more data. You had that equation in there somewhere. I read okay, it. It's a fundamental equation. And we sort of miss often, we read data through the Enlightenment Modernist Project as a sort of static thing, right? 
whereas in the high entropy thermodynamic model of post ontology, data only works as long as there's more of it. And so the acquisition of data is absolutely essential to the whole enterprise. So the enterprise, of course, then questions, well, how do you get more of it? So you need to get people like us to do things, uh, regardless of what it is that we do, to produce something that is always more higher in entropy. The Buddha knew this uh, 2,300 years ago, 2,600 years <laughs> ago, right? He, he did not say, he said to live is to suffer. He did not offer a way to live without suffering. He said, no, that's just not possible because to do anything is to feed the data beast, to put it in yes. your language. So his solution but he didn't want was, you to uh, sit under, under the tree for like five months or whatever, you know, to, to lo lo lower your entropy. Yeah, totally. He wanted you to check out. That's right. Completely check out. Completely. That's right. Then you get nirvana. Then you get nirvana. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that a solution? It could be a solution. I mean, that would certainly, <laughs> if everyone sat under the tree for a while, we'd all starve to death, but the data business would go bankrupt. Okay. But is that our, your only alternative you're offering? I mean, why is not the pre symbolic body, the erotic body, the shitting, pooing body? also a potential site of access not accessible to data. Yes, I think to some degree, that's always been a place where data hallucinogenics has difficulty sort of operating, except you could mm -hmm. sort of say, well, pornography does a great job <laughs> of uh, extracting uh, It's the full front of data, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. So how to do that with, his, with a sense of self and not get trapped into, you know, it's like I was just on a Zoom call having to do with uh, a, a cases because I'm on a committee that adjudicates sexual harassment cases. And people mm -hmm. going, well, you know, people now take pictures of their private parts and send them, you know, on mm -hmm. <laughs> Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I'm going like, who does that? I mean... <laughs> A lot of people. <laughs> I know, but it's like, you guys, you know, well, women, Robbie, don't you realize, you know, this doesn't just disappear. And, you know, but that's what I mean by the, the post-ontology. We, we sort of know all of these risks, but for some reason, we don't get it. We don't realize that there are risks to this, right? So we just participate in this. And that's the, the Stockholm why, Syndrome. Why? So, so that's the Stockholm Syndrome. So yeah. why do we participate? Because we, I think many people think that the digital world is a machine. That's how it's defined legally. I mean, that's how an how a algorithm is. It's legally a machine. And, and we, we don't see it as energy, right? As, as thermodynamic, as an active animist world where all of these things are not only seduced out of us, but also then stored processed, studied, mined, all those things, you know, we just, the human cannot really fathom the scale of that, right? You know, we live in our modernist naivety that we can control the narrative. Mm -hmm. Is architecture in any register a site of resistance? Well, the building of architecture is certainly not because the building architecture is completely enmeshed in the data capitalist world to a large extent. I mean, to a major major extent. Even go to Home Depot, it's, it's, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're, you're, you're walking into a global commodification enterprise. So um, with no guilt, I mean, that's the thing also, right? It's, it's a guiltless uh, form of capitalism. Right. So the building industry is not, and it's, it's really not, not possible. You know, so I don't, I don't really think that architecture itself can play a significant role unless you begin to think of how you can once again entrap the data in, in its own sort of hologramic world. So, you know, there's a, a, a film came out, it was maybe 10 years ago called The Smart House. Um, okay. 
and it was a pretty cool film. It was a B horror film. And this mm-hmm. guy had his girlfriend over, but the house, the smart house, didn't like the girlfriend. And basically <laughs> killed her because the girl, the house was built out of nanoparticles. And nanoparticles, you know, they, they, don't, they, they killed her. They just evaporated her out of existence. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. He, he didn't know what happened to her because she didn't exist anymore. And finally figured mm-hmm. out that the house had basically eaten her. Mm-hmm. And then the house, you know, was going to attack him. And he, the only way to get rid of this smart house was basically to, you know, bomb it. And so that's sort of the fantasy of where we're trying to go with all our smart houses, right? Is that to make them increasingly more embedded in in this, you know, doorbells and light bulbs and doors and doorknobs, you know, pretty soon every time you touch a doorknob. I mean, at MIT, every time I walk into my office, it registers, hello, Mark. You know, when I park my car, it says, thank you, Mark. Mm-hmm. So these are all just the beginning of so-called smart architecture that is going to be hard to uh, deal with increasingly in the future. I mean, architecture up until recently was sort of a dumb place to be, right? You had surveillance mm-hmm. cameras. That was about as smart yeah. as it got, right? But yeah. now surveillance cameras are very tiny between the doorknobs and the doorbells and all sorts of things, registers. It's... Sounds like you almost made a case for bombing architecture. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't want to live in a bombed out building, so. I can better... <laughs> but are they, as we come to the end over here, as Bob Dylan said, there must be some way out of here, said the joker to the thief, right? So what is the deontological project? Digital D D digital ontological pathway. So the the D post ontology. D post ontology. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a good question, you know, Vikram. I like, and I have to puzzle uh, puzzle over that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know I'm a bit of a pessimist about all of this, but I'm not Mm -hmm. trying to let pessimism guide my politics, so to speak. You know, I mean, if we do that, then we wind up in the rabbit hole. Uh, or you end up making Matrix, three Matrix movies. Yeah, exactly. Is... That's right. Yeah. You yeah. Know. So post-ontology is not like a space of clinical depression, right? I'm saying that actually it gives us a space where we can actually, for a, I think for a small time in our human history, experience a type of majesty to the human that we've never experienced before. I think this is going to go away pretty soon. But, you know, where I can monitor my own health, I can look at my own bank accounts. Mm-hmm. You know, this is, it, there's a form of transparency that it wants us to have mm-hmm. that is in some sense an, an empowerment. But it comes at a price. And increasingly that price is going to be stiffer and stiffer unless we're careful. All right, Mark. We're going to call it at that. Thanks for telling us about your post-ontological age and the digital Stockholm syndrome. We'll have to make give, record another time in a few months where you'll have a list of pathways out of the post-ontological age. That would be great. Look forward to that, Vikram. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Mary Lee. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.